A welcome and thank you everyone for joining us for another episode of the uh, Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions. And uh, today uh, we are going to be talking about 10 things you should ask before you buy some ag technology products, specifically irrigation products. But one thing I think about this subject is that uh, as, I, as I thought about it, researched a little bit and talked to Corey and Jeff about what they were going to present, I started to think this really, we're using the example of ag irrigation, but really these apply to almost any technology products you buy. And uh, I'll tell you, I was, uh, I've been doing some searching for a washer and dryer and uh, I was shocked to find out I can uh, use Bluetooth and uh, wirelessly connect my phone and start my dryer now. I mean, I haven't made the purchase yet, but that's something that's possible. This, uh, this technology is, uh, is, uh, is really expanding quickly and you really have to stay on top of it. So helping us stay on top of it today uh, is going to be Corey Broad and Jeff Toole. Now, Corey, as you know, is a certified crop advisor. He's a, a certified irrigation designer. He was the agriculturist of the year in Madera County a couple of years ago. He does a great job on these trainings. More importantly, he does an excellent job with all his customers. Uh, Corey really cares about the customers. He cares about what he's doing. And uh, he's really good about giving uh, solid advice to growers out there in the field. So Corey, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you for the kind words and, and introduction, Richard. Um, I'm happy to be here. And this is a topic and the kind of discussion that I think is very pertinent uh, given the amount of ag tech out there and also some of the challenges in agriculture, uh, not just in California, but in the United States. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, Corey. Thanks. And then we also have Jeff Toole. He's the executive uh, vice president of Jane Irrigation Holdings. And uh, Jeff is our thought leader on our ag technology products. Uh, Jeff has been involved in technology for more than 20 years and uh, has really uh, grabbed a hold of this vision of what agriculture can be. He's done a great job leading that at Jane. And we're really fortunate to have him on today because he is a uh, wealth of knowledge in this area. He's a wealth of knowledge in a lot of areas too, but uh, especially <laughs> these ag tech and, uh, and he's gonna help us. So uh, Jeff, uh, welcome also to you. Thanks Richard, it's, uh, it's always great to be here. This is uh, the first uh, joint webinar I, I've done with, uh, with Corey. So I'm excited about that. Corey and I really enjoy working you know, with him. Uh, he and I get involved in some pretty uh, in depth and, and sometimes pretty challenging issues that some of our growers are facing out there. And he's just a, a great, great resource. And so I'm just, just happy to be on with you guys today. Yeah. All right. So we've got a wealth of knowledge here. So uh, thanks to both of you. Now, one of the things I was thinking about is, uh, you know, I start to hear about some of these technology horror stories. And I think, uh, is this something that's getting blown out of proportion? Uh, is uh, the stories I'm hearing about irrigation, is it uh, solid irrigation or other technologies experiencing challenges too? What, uh, what, what, what's happening here? And, and, uh, and I'll start with you, Corey. Uh, do the uh, consumers really need to be aware? They do. And I think that's, again, kind of where the pertinence of the discussion comes from today. I think, you know, you talked about this uh, potential purchase you're looking at. You can make all of these uh, reviews. You can see a lot of information uh, there are independent kind of third parties, you know, consumer reports, uh, better, better Business Bureau. There's all these options that you have as a consumer to go and look and, and probably get a really objective review on something uh, pretty quickly. And in our industry, it's very hard to find that. And, you know, that's, again, kind of what we're going to go through today is what can you ask to empower yourself and, and try and get that report made? because uh, unfortunately there's not a lot of them just out there for you to access. Yeah, good points. Uh, and Jeff, what, what do you think about that? You know, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, I think, I was, I was thinking as Corey was responding and I have a lot of grower friends and they would, they would probably all say they learn about ag technology and a lot of things uh, through the school of hard knocks, uh, you know, unfortunately. And so, you know, as we'll, we'll talk more about today, there's just, you know, there's a lot of questions that should be asked and, and frankly um, need to be answered. You know, I think, I think we can all do a better job and growers can do a better job of 
holding us and their vendors, you know, more accountable. And that'll help ensure that, uh, that, that they're getting the solutions that they're paying for and investing in, in, in the long term. So I'm excited about today. Yeah, so I, I love one thing you said there, Jeff, and I really do believe this, that the onus of, you know, the responsibility of getting the right product for you does fall to you as the consumer, right? right. You have right. to go out and do your homework. You do have to research. Um, you have people that are trusted advisors, and of course, you're going to reach to them, but you have the responsibility too. And that's why I like that uh, you guys are going to talk about 10 things you should be asking. That way, um, I can really know as a, uh, as a consumer that I'm getting the, that I'm getting the right uh, technology, the right product for what I need. And it's not that I'm so worried that I'm going to have a blow up or a failure or something's really going to go bad. I just want to be sure I'm spending my money and getting the most for it. So that, that's what I'm excited about here. So anyway, well, Corey, I think we're going to start with you today, right? Yes, sir. We'll take it away. And uh, so the foundation for uh, the discussion today, this is actually the uh, third part of a three-part series for the Irrigation Consumer Bill of Rights, which was developed by Cal Poly, uh, the Irrigation Training and Research Center. And so we have two previous webinars that discuss more about uh, just general irrigation systems and, and those purchases, uh, but they've worked up a, a document. It's actually the longest document uh, of the three that's uh, titled Soil and Plant Moisture Monitoring Systems. So to freshen it up, make it also a little bit more tangible and easier, we kind of took the 10 uh, most important points that we felt um, were applicable for growers and potential consumers out. And that's what we're going to go through. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the ITRC for spending the time and the effort to put all of this together. Uh, it's available on the website, as you can see down below. Uh, the document is worth reading in its entirety. And uh, again, we appreciate them in, in helping us uh, as manufacturers uh, add value to the industry and empowering consumers uh, to ask the right questions. Yeah, thanks, uh, Corey, for pointing that out about the um, uh, Irrigation Research Training Center. Uh, they do a great job over there. And I do want to remind everybody, I have both the Q&A and the chat open uh, this afternoon. So if you've got some questions for Corey, Jeff, or myself, be sure to put them in there. And at the appropriate time, I'll, I'll pass them on. Thank you. Perfect. And uh, so kind of looking at ag tech as an overview, I think we know that ag tech's changing rapidly. And the number of farms that are using ag tech in a number of capacities is also increasing. And you know, many are familiar with these drivers of adoption, but you have increased labor costs, you have a decreased labor pool and availability, uh, maybe even unreliable at times. You, know, you have increased input costs and then stricter regulations. We're, we're not uh, unfamiliar with that in California. And then I think there's also a number of growers and operations that are looking for a competitive advantage. And it may not be today, but it's uh, you know, five year, a 10 year roadmap where they need to get data and they need to get actions that they can start implementing now to uh, measure those practices going forward. And so we have all these really great reasons to adopt technology. Uh, why are we having the discussion today then to say, hey, what, what should you watch out for? And I think, you know, this is really a, a generalization of what we're going to get into, but is the technology usable and does it do or achieve what you need it to do? Is the provider sound and reliable? And will that technology become obsolete? And not just obsolete in the sense of uh, it doesn't work anymore or is not supported, but is there eventually a better resolution or better data that um, you could have invested in and a technology that'll be more relevant, I would say longer. So that's uh, kind of the way that I approach that. Um, but jumping into our topics at hand, uh, starting with number one, and I like this at the beginning of the document, they say before purchasing any equipment, have you had your system distribution uniformity checked of your irrigation system? And underperforming irrigation systems not gonna allow that full utility of what you're investing or purchasing in because your system is not performing up to standards. So no matter what you're measuring, you're kind of getting bad data in a way. And at Jane, our first recommendation is like with our water management service is that you have a system uniformity check done. We actually provide that for our customers. And you know the reality is, is if your uh, field or system is scoring too low, we would prefer that you would invest that money into the system to make sure that it's up to par so that you can maximize that value of the investment. 
And, you know, the best way I can break it down is, you know, Teslas are, are very popular. It's kind of one of the most technological cars on the road today. Uh, it's very efficient. If I gave you a Tesla, Richard, would you want to drive it with the parking brake on? I don't think that would, that would bode well. Even though it has all this technology and all this great stuff, I think, you know, you're, you're missing a, a, a big opportunity uh, for utilization of that investment. Yeah, so Corey, I just want to interrupt a second. And um, because I don't, how big of a roadblock is this? Uh, how long does a DU uh, take, right? Uh, and I think this is distribution uniformity, right? Uh, and is it expensive? And is this just, is this the first roadblock in me getting technology? And I just say, hey man, <laughs> this is already sounding too complicated. No, I, I think that's a, a, a fair question. Uh, the amount of time that it takes in the grand scheme of things is, is really nothing. There's a lot of providers out there that, that can do this for you. There's also training available so you can do it yourself with your field staff and, and understand your system a little bit better. And the reality is there's a lot of simple steps that can be taken uh, in order to improve irrigation efficiency on the farm. And I mean, that could be maybe another webinar we do one day, which is, hey, here are the 10 simple steps to um, quote, get your car running better. And I, I think that there's, there's a ton of opportunity. It really is not that uh, much of a barrier to entry. Um, if uh, getting a physical was a barrier to getting surgery, um, we would do a lot less surgeries in this country. So um, physicals are, are you know, pretty straightforward, pretty common. It's, it's no different than that. I think that's a really good point, Corey. And we often find that uh, there is no shortcut to excellence, right? 100%. We want to be uh, the best grower we can be, then uh, the, these are some steps we need to take there. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So kind of looking uh, at the next set of slides, I was going to pass it over to Jeff and uh, give him the opportunity to expand on, on some of these points. Sounds good. I think you, you gave me all the hard ones. So um, you certainly gave me a few of the more politically charged up ones, but I'm, I'm up for it. I'm excited about it. Um, you know, here in this particular instance on uh, question two, there's really, there's two very important and, and often misunderstood questions. How many sensors will be used per field? And you've know, heard all kinds of rules of thumb on that. And then at what depths, you know, will the sensors be placed in a single location? So originally I thought about answering this in general for just sensors in general, but the depth question really, I think IRTC was, was uh, aiming this towards soil moisture sensors. So. You know, I'll talk generally, but but that was the intent was looking at uh, soil moisture. For me to answer these questions, we really need to answer some clarifying questions. So I'm I'm going to encourage um, the growers out in our audience to 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 listen to these clarifying questions because this is what every vendor should be talking with you about. They should be asking these clarifying questions, and if they're not then, uh, I mean, frankly, you should probably go on to the next, next vendor. So the first thing I would ask uh, is what is the crop? And the main, the main reason for this uh, question is determine really the, the targeted uh, rooting depth, which in turn answers the second question of at what depth will the sensors be placed? So row crops typically have shallower rooting depth. So commonly we're looking at soil moisture between say four and 24 inches max. So if someone's trying to sell you a 48 inch or a 60 inch soil moisture probe for your tomatoes or your onions or cotton corn, you know, melon crops, something like that, it would be a total waste of money. Uh, not to mention, you know, much harder to remove uh, before harvest, because we all know on the row crops, you're going to pull the soil moisture probes out um, before you harvest. When you're looking at permanent crops, such as almonds, pistachios, vineyards, citrus, et cetera, <clears throat> walnuts, the rooting depth is, is much deeper. And um, this is where you should get a recommendation for, I would say at least a 36 inch probe. And in most cases, uh, 48 inch would be more appropriate. That's probably what we would recommend. But we also have a lot of our permanent crop growers that have salt issues. And so they'll ask for a 60 inch probe because they really wanna see the water movement down past the root zone when they're trying to flush the salts down. So you wanna be able to see that movement if you get the right kind of probe, you know, you'll, you'll be able to see EC. 
So you'll be able to see uh, the salts and see the movement of the salts, which can also be, uh, be important. But the key here to choosing depth is knowing the soil profile that you're farming to. And that will really ensure that you're keeping your irrigation water and the nutrients in that, in that soil zone. So that's really, that's really what you're after. Now, to answer how many sensors, the most important clarifying question here is, how much variation is there in the field in terms of soil? And I'm even gonna say elevation. Soil variation is pretty obvious. We all, we all talk about that, but, but a lot of vendors do not consider elevation change, which can affect the flow of water, pooling, um, drain down you know, the irrigation system, et cetera. But you should always consider placing sensors in areas of the field where you have significant soil variation. And it's really to cover any significant uh, differences in soil holding capacity and infiltration rates. We really don't have time. We've done some other webinars on this uh, to go into the details on this, but just suffice it to say that lighter, sandier soils take, uh, take water much differently than heavier, tighter soils do. And you should always consider that when deciding on the number of, of sensors and placement. And then lastly, I would say uh, the vendor should be asking how many irrigation sets do you run for the field? So I, my rule of thumb, um, and this is not you know one size fits all, every situation is a little different, is that if, if the soil is reasonably consistent across the field, then you can get away with one sensor on 100 acres or less. Now that may sound like a lot of acres, but if you have a fairly uniform field and you have a good DU, you're not gonna see huge variations in, in the soil, you know, the holding capacity and infiltration. It's rare, to be honest, to get that kind of field. If it's a larger field or has soil variation and multiple irrigation sets, then you should really consider putting sensors in each set and or soil type. And I would say the ideal setup would be to have one sensor for each set so you can monitor the applied water and, and what it's doing for, uh, for each irrigation set. And to wrap up on this slide, in my mind, the big takeaway here is to make sure your vendor is asking these clarifying questions and you are getting recommendations that would be consistent with your field, your crop and your farming practices. Jeff, those are great points. And um, every once in a while, I hear somebody say, well, we can do this without using sensors at all. Uh, is that a red flag or can people do it without sensors too? I mean, yeah, it would be a red flag for me. I mean, I think there's, they're talking about some satellite technology out there, you know, that can do some water balance calculations and things like that. I mean, you know, frankly, we haven't seen that as, you know, one, the satellite is not there when you're applying the water. Um, you know, you don't see infiltration rates and, um, you know, I think getting a moisture unit, looking at MUs and the changes that are occurring dynamically as you irrigate are, are super critical and making sure that that water and the nutrients are staying in the root zone. So that, that would be a little bit of a red flag if that was the only approach they were recommending. Yeah, so really, if you could do satellite imaging and sensors, that's probably the best way to go. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. All right, great. Yeah, so I appreciate that question that came in while we were uh, presenting. There we go. So I think I have this one as well. Um, you know, this question, it, it should seem pretty straightforward. You know, cellular network is involved. You know, we're talking about reliable service and just cellular in general. We all have cell phones. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of vendors can be misleading in their answers in this. So Again, I would, I'll go through kind of what you should be thinking about, the questions you should be asking here. The communications between the devices and up to the cloud are, are they really critical as far as having reliable communications. And if you don't have reliable communications, you're gonna have missed data, you're gonna miss irrigations if you're using automation. And that can be one of the most frustrating elements uh, in any ag tech solution that you might choose. So. I mean, generally speaking, most cellular-based cellular -based, uh, telemetry devices today, they are reliable with two, two caveats. Who is the provider, meaning 
AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, et cetera. And then if the vendor's device is limited to one carrier, make sure uh, there is acceptable service for that carrier in, in your field. And there's really you know, only a couple of ways to test that, and that's to have something with that service out in the field. The second caveat is related to unreliable reception, and that could be caused by the type of cellular antenna used. So we see this quite often. You should ask, is the cellular antenna internal or external to the device? If it's internal, um, ask the question, simple question, can, the, can, can an external antenna be added for more reliable service? Sometimes in poor reception areas, the cellular modem uh, antenna has to be, it has to be elevated to get reliable service. So if the vendor's device will not support it, your service will simply be sporadic or, or non-existent. And I would say, and this isn't necessary to poke at any specific vendors out there, but we run into it. We hear these stories all the time. Be careful when you're quoted uh, a standard antenna or you're not, you don't ask the questions. And then when the installation occurs, the installer tells you, hey, I need to put a, a high gain antenna in and put it on a, you know, a 30 foot tower. And that's going to be another, you know, $600 or another thousand dollars. And maybe you made the decision to go with that vendor because they were cheaper. And now all of a sudden, you know, you've got to uh, upgrade three or four sites right out of the gate with an extra, you know, five, six hundred thousand dollars um, per site in order to get reliable communication. Um, on the radio side of things, um, most radios are, are 900 megahertz. Most, most of all suppliers, vendors are using 900 megahertz. And I would say the biggest thing there is just be cautious on how far uh, they say the radio will reliably communicate. It's, it's probably um, the number one, what I'll call spec stretch in our industry. You know, when someone tells you their radio will communicate five or even maybe three miles for, you know, five, four, three miles, make sure you read the fine print because that typically will say when it's on top of a hill with direct line of sight down to the radios below. And, um, you know, it's just with FCC wattage limitations, radios are, are simply not reliable beyond a mile or two. And that can even be cut in half down to a half mile or less in heavy tree canopy unless you can elevate the antenna to achieve line of sight. So some people might have said line of sight a few times. They might be you know, wondering what the heck I'm talking about. It's, it's super simple. It's just a direct line between two points without any obstructions you know, between them. So you can think hills, trees, buildings, you know, any of those kinds of things will obstruct um, line of sight. And 900 megahertz is pretty good um, as far as transmission goes. Uh, but it's still, you know, limited to that, to that nine, line of sight. If you, typically it's about 1500 feet. If you have a lot of canopy and or buildings um, that might be in the way of it. So just be care, careful of that. You can use directional antennas and repeaters to get greater distances. Again, ask that question. Just make sure the vendor's equipment supports it and that the costs are included in your quote. Um, if, if needed. And I think, uh, let's see, we've got one other here, you know, on the redundancy side, uh, that question, daisy chain. Daisy chain simply means that multiple telemetry devices communicate through one another back and forth to, to a gateway or to a central communication device. And typically that would be called a, a mesh network. Um, the redundancy comes in when the system uh, can communicate via alternative paths. Um, if one path is not working and any system you purchase should do that automatically. Um, it's, it's also on the redundancy side, it's also important to know um, if the field devices store data for a reasonable amount of time, if the communications were to go down and then transmit all of that data, once communications are, are restored, and this is, this is really critical if the device is being used for control, say to start a pump or operate a, a valve or something like that. In other words, if I, if I have an irrigation schedule set to run and I lose communications, will the schedule still run 
And um, you should definitely make sure any system you're considering will do this. And unfortunately not all do. And then I guess I would say, you know, lastly, I, I would have to fire myself if I didn't take this opportunity <laughs> to say that Jane you know, Logic RC3 uh, telemetry device has both cellular and 900 megahertz capability built in. And it's got enough storage to house about 10 days worth of data if communications um, are lost. And um, if you were running an irrigation schedule and communication suddenly went out during the, the irrigation schedule, it would complete that irrigation schedule without, uh, without interruption. So we've tried to, to think of those things and build those things in. Got to talk about peace of mind, uh, what you just said, right? That just gives the grower peace of mind and, and um, <clears throat> might be something most people don't think about until they have the problem. Right. So I'm really glad you brought that up. And then the communication side of it, I've seen so many projects or enough projects derail because of communication. I know that I like, one of the first things I like uh, um, people specking uh, projects to ask is how's the cell coverage? Let's find this out right away let's figure yeah. out what and that way we don't get down the road and have a problem so uh yeah, I, think this, I think this is a great one it's a tricky one for sure yeah so i think i have this one as well um you know we'll talk a little bit about annual costs and you know this when i got to thinking about answering this question it's a it's a little bit of tricky tricky one because all of the vendors in ag tech we all charge a little differently and um, so the best advice I can give up front is, is to make sure you ask for all life cycle costs associated with the equipment and then any associated services. You know, ask those questions. For a standard system purchase at Gene, we give a price for the hardware, the installation cost, and the annual subscription as three separate amounts. So you know exactly um, what you're paying for uh, for each one. And the only exception to that is, as Corey mentioned, our, our new water management services, where we give a single uh, dollar per acre per year price. And that's all in that. That includes the hardware, the installation, the maintenance, the DU test Corey talked about. And, um, and then probably most importantly, the, the weekly scheduling uh, reports. We really don't, we don't do any a la carte pricing unless there's something specialized that the grower needs. And um, I would say when you're talking about the annual cost with the vendor, it's, it's also a good time to ask them about warranties. Uh, ours is a, we have a three-year warranty, which I think is industry leading um, on our C3 telemetry device. And then on any of the other devices that we connect um, from third parties such as soil moisture probes or flow meters, weather stations, et cetera. We pass along that warranty um, to you, but we handle everything for you. And um, some, some vendors take a more a la carte approach and um, you can pick the various features and services that you want and then add up the total. There's really nothing wrong with that. Um, some will provide general maintenance as part of their annual service or subscription fees. You just need to make sure to ask and um, I'm not aware, you know, the one on the bottom here, the tractor blight, the wear and tear, I'm not aware of any that include uh, gene, uh, that include, including gene, that cover tractor blight, animal damage, or, or wear and tear. Um, and I think I might have skipped, I skipped over, sorry, installation costs. I'll be quick on this one. So, you, you know, the question of can you do it yourself? Most telemetry equipment, wiring, control wiring, soil moisture probes, et cetera, they, they require professional installation. In my opinion, uh, the costs are minimal, and frankly, you want the vendor to do it. Uh, a few companies some years ago tried self-installations, and the growers ended up paying more and being frustrated when the company had to send technicians out there to fix installation problems. So if the vendor installs it, then they're responsible for the system working properly and any of the workmanship issues that might arise. And um, one thing I do wanna say is not all installations are equal. It's really important. So I would encourage you to inspect actual sites um, for any vendor that you're consider, uh, considering. And, and I have seen everything from duct tape to wire ties holding devices, antennas on poles. I mean, it's, it's terrible wires laying loosely on 
compound are strung across the filter station pad. And um, in my opinion, how the installation looks is the level of professionalism you can expect from the vendor. So even if you can't make it out to sites for that supplier you're thinking about, have them give you pictures of, of installation, of recent installations, and then hold them accountable to that same level of install on your system. And I can definitely proudly say I feel, you know, Jane is, uh, is unmatched in, in the area of, of installation. Our guys are just so clean and so tidy using conduit. Everything's bolted down. Um, it's just really clean. And we get, we get compliments on that part of, all the time. Yeah, two things, Jeff, I want to mention is uh, one, so true about the installations. When you think about the amount of money that is in that field behind you in your uh, in your screen share right now, right. You know, this is uh, a few hundred dollars for a professional installation where you know it's set up correctly and done right is, um, is nothing. Right. Um, and then the other thing I really appreciate about what you guys do is your transparency in the pricing. And oftentimes I've run into people who uh, might say, well, such and such product is less. And then we, we um, drill down and we find out, well, that's one subscription, one person using it on one device. And uh, it's intentionally done to really get you to that product on a product comparison one-to-one, -one, which is what mostly people do. So uh, I love that you guys are so transparent with your pricing and uh, I would feel really comfortable if I was a grower, knowing that I was uh, uh, paying, knowing what I was paying for and what I was getting. No, and I appreciate that. It's it's something on the subscription side. You know, we have we have a, a one price. I mean, you know, we'll have a different price if you, depending on volume or, you know, certain elements within the field. But that one price is the price. We don't have like a super duper software subscription that you, you pay extra for. And if you want the price I quoted, that's the basic software, you know, it's, 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 uh, you can look at things, but you can't really do anything. I mean, we just, there's just none of that, that, uh, you, so it's one price, you get access to the entire software and, um, yeah, that's, that's I think the best way to go. Yeah. And that's the other thing that I appreciate about Jane unity uh, as well is, um, uh, sometimes a business model for a new company is we're going to attract a bunch of subscribers. We're going to build our subscriber base. We're not going to charge them much to, to get on. And then uh, we're going to show some uh, investment group, some venture capital group, how many subscribers we have. And we're going to get bought because of our, our subscribers. Uh, right. it's, um, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a gamble, one, that they'll get the subscribers if people won't see through that. And two, it's not a really long-term sustainable business plan for the subscribers. Right. Uh, whoever buys that company uh, is going to face some hurdles and challenges. So uh, I love that that's not an issue for Jane um, uh, Logic uh, either. Yep, absolutely. So I think this is where I jump back in again and uh, kind of yeah. taking the words right out of my mouth, Richard, as far as just, it's just transparency. You know, if you took those few slides that Jeff did together, it, it doesn't matter uh, whether it was the price or physically the service being provided, it was really, it all comes down to transparency. The, the, the vendor supplier needs to be transparent with the customer on what are you getting, how well will it work, and how much does it cost me? And I think if you get that for most people uh, in most purchases, you're probably going to have a happy customer and, and a successful relationship. Um, so Jeff kind of touched on, you know, uh, who would be responsible for, for breakdowns and things like that. Um, but, you know, just looking at durability in agriculture, you know, we understand that ag is tough. These things are out in the environment uh, in the elements and, and they're kind of getting exposed to a number of different things. We, we do see tractor blight every once in a while, unfortunately, uh, on, on a number of things in the field. Um, but your durability is going to be important. And Jeff touched on it. Understand the life cycle of, of that equipment. I think we have a pretty good understanding of uh, our tractors, our sprayers, our harvesters, what's the life cycle of that piece of equipment? What things need to be maintained more often? Uh, it, so on and so forth. With this new investment, something you've maybe never handled before, uh, understanding that from your supplier, I think is really important. It's going to influence the cost of that system over time. I think we're really proud to always kind of discuss, hey, this is our total cost of ownership based on kind of what you're looking at purchasing. And obviously it varies on you know, your scale and what you're getting, but 
having the lowest total cost of ownership. Uh, you see a lot of automotive makers uh, trying to market that as well, because it's not about the price of it today. It's about, this is a 10 year investment, a 20 year investment. Um, what is the cost of that? And I think that's really uh, a fair question to ask and understand. Another way that durability plays in, and, and I put the second part of this question in here is how accurate is the sensor? And that's important because if you have a product that isn't very durable, it depends on the type of product. Is it a fail product or is it a wear product? A wear product would be generally something like your car tires, where there's a broad range of values, you know, before it blows out, hopefully. Um, so how that tire performs on mile one versus mile 50,000, and then you didn't get them replaced and now it's 100,000 and then you're surprised when it blows out. But what's the, the uh, effectiveness of that product in, at those times? And so you can end up with data that's either missing if it's a product that just fails, or you can end up with corrupted data because maybe it wears out over time. And so understanding that's important. And then on the actual physical accuracy of the product, you need to understand how important accuracy is to your task. And I, I say that in the sense that can a sensor be 5% off plus or minus and still add value? I think in certain instances, actually it can. Uh, in other instances, it certainly can't. And so what you have to understand is how accurate is it, but also what does it cost you to get that next level of resolution? Because maybe there is another product out there that provides it, but wow, that's 3X, 5X, 10X what I would be spending. Could I live without that? And so just understanding those nuances, I think is, is really key to picking the right sensor. Yeah, so true, Corey. And, you know, I'm holding up my phone right now. I don't think you can see it, though. But I always think about if I strap this to a pole and put it in a pistachio field for a year, is it going to work a year later? And uh, my guess is probably not. And uh, when I see the uh, low, low percentage of uh, returns or issues with uh, the Jane equipment in the field, uh, I'm just blown away by how uh, bulletproof it is. 100%. And as somebody who manages water for customers and really depends on it just as much, uh, maybe sometimes more than they do, because I'm the one who's looking at it. I, I've been super impressed over the years and, and really have no issue recommending this to any of my customers that are currently, you know, utilizing some technology or people who are jumping into it, because I know it's going to be there because it's there for me. I've essentially taken the, the grower's role in certain instances, and I rely on it a lot. So I'm, I'm very proud of that. Um, but, but on the topic there, I, I kind of talked about missing and corrupted data. Jeff touched on this a little bit earlier as well. Uh, looking at how often that data is transferred from the field to a base station or particularly the cloud in certain instances and in the interval in which the data is collected, I think it's important because as Jeff said, if there's a temporary outage, can that system hold data or a command if it's in the middle of an automation cycle? Um, understanding that's really important. And then the data resolution as far as how often it's being pulled. So if you have a soil moisture probe in the ground, do you want data uh, intervals that are every day where it's just taking one snapshot at one time or do you want something that's maybe every 15 minutes? Uh, it really depends on your scenario, but I'll say this, when it comes to irrigation events, having a data resolution uh, more frequently than daily is super important because you can see how water is moving through the profile better. You can look at evaporation. You can look at weather influences, uh, runoff. It, it just gives you that, that tighter resolution that I, I think you deserve as a consumer. And then if the information is current, and I use that in quotations there, and not maybe every day, but every 15 minutes, or maybe even, even uh, tighter intervals, can it uh, provide a, an alert for you? Because I think that's a huge value added. We're, we're measuring all of this data. What if I can tell you, hey, Richard, uh, just like your washing machine would, hey, it's time to switch the, the laundry, like you said earlier with the Bluetooth. Why can't uh, my irrigation system say, I just performed your irrigation event? or your irrigation system's on, or, hey, you have a really high flow situation, maybe something broke, uh, so on and so forth. So having that alerting function, I think takes that data and moves it in towards that manageable action, which I'll, I'll touch on here in a little bit. You know, Corey, I just wanna share a quick, quick story. We had a customer, um, you know, this, this gentleman's a good, good customer, good friend of mine, uh, one of our WMS customers and he, the cell service in his area went down a couple of weeks ago. And so 
um, the devices stopped reporting and we were upset about that. We went out, checked, made sure everything was okay. Everything was okay. Cell tower was down. And so we thought, okay, it'll probably come back up pretty quick. It didn't. So one of our guys, David Lindsay, put, put, took the C3, put it in his truck, drove several miles till he got to a new a cell, cell tower that had service. The C3 connected, it downloaded the data. He drove it back out, put it back into the field, kept collecting data. And then when communication restored, so Richard, in your phone conversation, I was just thinking it'd be like you starting a conversation, losing connection, not knowing you lost it, keep talking. And then the person on the other end is talking too, and you don't know it. And then when you get more cell service, the whole conversation is, you know, is, was kept for you. And so I don't know, it's just a cool story of, I think, how technology should work. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna guess too, and this is another reason why I think it's a really cool story. I know David Lindsay's commitment to customers. Right. right. Uh, and how rabid he is about that. And yeah. I'm gonna guess that, uh, I mean, I think a lot of listeners out there are probably thinking, gee, how much did that cost? Now, if this is a water management service customer, what did this cost them, Jeff? Nothing. As you're talking about to, to for for David and I watch it, somebody just opened my door. So yeah. I backed away for just a second. Yeah, I meant just for the for the service call of David Lindsay. Oh. I think it was thrown in. That was included. It was. Yeah, as I said, nothing. Didn't didn't cost the customer anything. And um, that's part of that the partnership, you know, that we have there as part of our water management services. So no, I, I think that's a great story, Jeff, and, and really shows the commitment of what we're doing and, and what we're willing to do for customers. And, and again, it plays right back into the total cost of ownership. Uh, maybe other people would have said, hey, you know, uh, it's not my fault that Verizon's down. I, I can't control it um, or, or whoever the provider may have been. And yet, you know, we, we can find a way to, to make that work. So um, as somebody who is in the field a lot and, and uh, doing water management for customers and, and working on irrigation systems, uh, this slide is really pertinent to me. So how will that information be displayed? So we talked about getting all that data out of the field, but now how is it coming to you as the end user? And um, with that, are there downloadable files with values? So personally, I believe that data should be able to be accessed offline uh, once it's out of the field and then uh, could be downloaded onto a laptop or uh, some type of hard drive in Excel or another program. And basically making that data more tangible helps you increase the value of that data. Uh, there's a number of different layers that you could put that on uh, within your own organization. But I, I think that's a really fair uh, question to ask and probably something you should look for. Uh, from the uh, information display, the software should be easy to use uh, no matter what device you're using it on. So as somebody who's in the field a lot, I'm using it on my iPhone. If you see the pictures on the left-hand side, that's actually a screenshot off of my iPhone 12 that I took. It's for one of my water management customers. And these are, I kind of customized my view. These are the three things that come up when I open up the app. And these are the three things that are most important to me. It can be customized for each person. Uh, but again, it's easy to use. It's very good resolution for a cell phone and um, should be a requirement for the grower. Because if I had to use my laptop every time, it would be significantly uh, less valuable for me uh, because I may not have it with me all the time. And then talking about some of that easeability, look for graphs and charts as options and not just the traditional graph. So you can see there's you know one line graph at the top there, but that's not a traditional soil moisture chart that a lot of people provide where it's each sensor individually uh, over a certain time frame. I actually customize this into a management zone. And so I'm looking at data that's taking it from an area and then providing that to me. So it's very personalized and it's, I know exactly what it means and it's easy for me to consume. In other instances, we have our infiltration chart that we developed, which is essentially just those graphs inverted that's showing water moving down through the soil profile. So by just clicking on the icon, you can look at it and you can say, wow, my last irrigation event, I got water down to 36 inches. Uh, hey, my goal is to get a little bit deeper. All right, well, I ran 12 hours. Maybe I need to run 16. And so very quickly, you can, you can see that uh, and get that information. I think that's where uh, a bunch of value is added. 
That's amazing. You can just see that on your phone that easily. All right, I think I'm up. And again, you gave me the uh, the controversial the controversial questions. You know, this this is really it's a hot and serious topic in our industry. And unfortunately, there have been a lot of ag tech companies that have had to shut their doors. And um, you know, most people think these situations are limited to to small startups. But you know, look at what look at what happened with Rainbird and uh, Climate Miner. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a big deal. Um, you know, when companies big or small shut down or pull out, it's hard on the growers that, that supported them. And that makes it harder on companies like Gene that are committed to the long term. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's, there's not a more difficult, I can say this from experience, there's not a more difficult sale than a scorned grower that's invested good money into ag technology uh, to only be left, you know, hanging in the wind with equipment that's basically worthless. It's, it's like the old saying, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, you know, shame on me. And we can't blame growers. Um, however, as we said, you know, at the very beginning of this, I, I do believe growers can and should do a better job of vetting the company um, that they're thinking of doing business with. They should look at how long they've been in business. Um, and by this, I mean commercially viable, not when they started tinkering with the idea um, in a basement or in a, a barn or something like that. Ask who backs them financially, who their owners are. You know, do they have enough cash flow to sustain the business in the long term? Because that's what you're in it for. As a grower, you're in it for the long term. If they're owned by private equity, what's the exit strategy? And I, I have nothing against private equity. I've run two companies owned by private equity firms, and they really do a great job of helping companies grow by infusing cash. But rest assured, they're in it for one thing, and that's a return on investment. And um, they will sell it, or they will try to get other investors to invest within a three to seven year window, depending on their strategy with, with that particular investment. And the key for growers is to understand the risks and to gather enough factual data to make a sound uh, sound investment. Now, Jane has been in the agricultural business since 1963, which was the year I was born. So I don't want to bring that up, but it's the truth. Um, and they have been investing in growing their ag business in the U.S. since 1985. And they've made three significant acquisitions in ag tech over the last six years. So, you know, on top of those investments, We've continued to invest more than a million per year in innovating and improving the robustness of our software and hardware platforms. Things, things like data transmission and processing speeds, information security, uptime, reliability. We have long-term growers, you know, Richard alluded to this a little bit. We have a long, we have long-term growers that are now upgrading their sites that have been operating in their fields for more than 13 years. And that's significant. I mean, that, that, that's significant. And, you know, if I seem passionate about this topic, it's because I am. I have talked with too many growers that have been left with inoperable and abandoned equipment or speak about the hyped up sales pitch they bought into only to be left with little or no support. You know, these, these facts, they're facts. These facts have set our industry back in terms of technology adoption. It's made growers skeptical, and who can who can blame them? Um, I'll get off my soapbox, but I truly encourage any growers considering investing in ag tech to do the same due diligence on the company you're about to partner with, just like you would, just like you would if you were buying uh, new ground or or making a, a financial investment or taking on a partner in your business. And then the last bullet on here goes it, it kind of goes without saying you should definitely know before you ever sign any purchase agreement or contract, um, whether you're, you're going to own the equipment or lease or rent it, there, there should absolutely, absolutely be no surprises. And, uh, don't be shy about asking, you know, these, these questions. Yeah. I love those questions. Jeff. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. So this is a, this is a much more, a fun slide here, so no, nothing, nothing controversial. Uh, 
it's a great area uh, to explore with the vendor. Um, how expandable is the, is the system? You know, no one, no grower ever comes out of the gate and buys everything they need to cover their farming, you know, their entire farming operations with ag technologies. You know, most often, and for some of the reasons that I just talked about on the former slide, growers start slowly. They start with a field or maybe a couple of fields. And it could be they're just, you know, wanting to test the technology, they just want to get in or they've been burnt. Even within fields, they may only want to start with just soil moisture monitoring and perhaps a weather station. So sometimes it's even trimmed down further. So the key advice you know, I would give on this is to ask the vendor to give you a design as if you're going to cover the entire ranch. Ask specifically about what additional hardware is necessary to expand. So, so questions like, what if I added pressure monitoring or flow monitoring? What if I want, uh, want to add pump control and valve control? How about monitoring my reservoir level or chemical tank level? Think about what's important to your farming operation and then ask how they would incorporate it. You know, in, in my opinion, the best systems are flexible and the best companies can offer a one-stop shop to meet your needs. So a dedicated or single function device, it will limit your options and it will force you to either have to add a lot more devices at higher costs or to go to another vendor to get what you need. And this, this kind of brings up another subject that I think is important for you to, to, to uh, ask. And we hear growers all the time say how tired they are of having to deal with two, three, four different vendors to get the technology they need. There are a number of vendors that partner with a lot of other companies because, you know, frankly, they can't provide what, what you need themselves. I hear, I hear stories all the time of the finger pointing that goes on when something doesn't work and, and the grower ends up trying to chase down which so-called partner's equipment is causing the problem. They're literally getting bounced back and forth. You know, one saying our system's working fine, it's their API or it's their hardware that's causing the problem. I just want to say be cautious if someone tells you they work with everyone. <laughs> sounds good. We all heard it, right? It sounds good. It looks good on marketing materials, but it can be quite a pain. I won't finish the pain uh, where it's a pain to work through these problem resolutions, you know, in, in the field. So make sure you understand who will be responsible for, for resolving issues. And Jane has a one partner perspective and that grower, the partner is the grower. That's that's who our partner is. And yeah. we are a true one-stop shop. And, and if it's attached to one of our devices or you can see it in our Logic software, then we supplied it, we installed it, and you will only ever have to deal with one company. And, um, you know, frankly, we've gotten some criticism from some of our competitors for not opening up our system uh, to, to connect with everyone. And with uh, the breadth of our offering and our commitment to the grower as our partner, we simply do not feel the need to, and we will never get into the finger pointing game. And that's just not, not who we are as a, as a company. Yeah, Jeff, I really love this question, how expandable is the system? Because really a good, uh, good manager should be thinking, where am I gonna be five years, 10 years down the road? Will yeah. this fit my need? Because I'm not doing it twice. Right. And I'm I'm going to do it right. I'm going to do it right the first time. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think those are, those are good points. And so we've talked about getting all of this data. We've talked about all this equipment, your uh, irrigation systems running great. Now, really the, the thing that I'm probably most passionate about, at least in our business and the way that we go about it is the level of training uh, that's going to be provided in data interpretation really, in my opinion, for, for full utility, and I think Jeff would agree, it's going to require layers of training and support in ag tech. Um, it's a new venture for, for most people. And so we look at it every day and we don't know everything, but we see, we see it a lot given our site counts and the amount of customers that we work with and the amount of crops. We, we can provide that, that level of support and training. So whether it's sales support, so we talked about that designing for the future, uh, understanding your crop, how many sensors, your application, 
all the way through to our kind of behind the scenes, more often customer service team, but they do a great job. Everything from billing to, um, hey, I need a, a minor site adjustment or uh, like what Richard Gates would do to provide some, some on the phone support, uh, looking at your system, making sure that it's doing what you need it to do, getting that data uh, just to the field service, whether it is your account manager uh, or, or some of our folks that go out, if you do have an issue, tractor blight, hey, this pulls down, can we get it up and running? Yes, we're right on it. We'll get it taken care of. I, that's the approach that we take. But I love that we go one step further as a group. And this is really our strength is, you know, we accessing that data through all this training. So we, we say, hey, Mr. Customer, here's how you get all these uh, great graphs. Uh, thank you. And uh, let me know if you need anything. Well, I give you all this data, well, what do you do with it? And so getting that help and turning that data into manageable action is really where the value is created or at least maximized in, in my opinion. Uh, we have great account managers. We have a number of people with certifications. We are the most certified company in irrigation uh, from the Irrigation Association. We also have some uh, accreditations through the American Society of Agronomy. Uh, ask about the level of training that you're gonna get uh, not just the support and, hey, how do I log in? Hey, how do I log out? But what do I do with this data? How does this help me? Yes, my water got down here, but how much water did I put on? And why didn't the water move through this profile the way that I thought it would? Because there's a lot of assumptions that growers uh, take, especially when adopting uh, to drip irrigation. You know, if you're a first time drip irrigation or micro irrigation farmer and you're implementing ag tech, there's a whole new learning curve that gets implemented there. And we are more than qualified, in my opinion, the most qualified to help you take that journey. So yeah, well said, well yeah, said. I I well said. Mentioned, you know, Jeff Klein from uh, Klein Family Farms on a few weeks ago or a month ago. And that was the thing he said, he'd bought tech before and it was kind of, here's your stuff, good luck. And he said with uh, Jane, it was completely different. Uh, they're there to partner with you. Um, Jane is there to uh, uh, help you learn uh, exactly what you need to get out of the technology. So he, he was, that was the number one thing that he was impressed with was the, uh, the training and, uh, and what we do uh, as a follow-up after. Well said, well said. Yeah, so you guys, a lot of information today and I really appreciate all this. Uh, boy, uh, I'm thinking about these questions, not for when I buy ag tech only, but when I'm buying any technology, I think they were spot on. I thought that was really good. But uh, if I'm thinking about it a day from now, a week from now, a month from now, can I reach out? Can I call you guys? Can we talk about this? Anytime. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. That means anybody who's watching, right? Can, yeah. Uh, can reach out. yeah. And it happens. Always. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, uh, we always joke, right? I'm not that hard to find between uh, social media and uh, driving around. So I'm more than happy to, to talk to anybody here, uh, obviously being uh, local to the Fresno area and covering most of the Central Valley, but talk to growers from all over that, that are interested in technology and, and have questions because at the end of the day, it's about uh, using water uh, appropriately and to maximum benefit. So wherever that is, we're, we're more than happy to pitch in and help out. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Uh, Jeff and Corey, thanks again. Really appreciate your time today. For those of you viewing, um, thank you. Um, uh, really appreciate that you guys are here and learning. And remember, you can see all our trainings at the Jane's USA forward slash trainings page on our website. Uh, we're also, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, and our podcasts have really been growing in popularity lately, uh, which is very encouraging to me to know that people are out there trying to better to themselves, even when they're on the job, driving job to job, they're still trying to learn. And that's, uh, that, that makes me feel good uh, and encouraged for, uh, for the future of ag and the future of technology. So Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend, and uh, we'll see you back here next week. You too, Richard. Thanks, Thanks Richard. All right. Thank you.